Thanks, Lily. Thanks, everyone. Well, good afternoon, and um, thanks for having me. So I come at this conference from maybe a slightly different background than most of you. So I have undergraduate training in environmental health, which is more broadly the influence of the environment on human health, um, PhD in microbiology, um, also some cell biology research, a postdoc in cancer research, and now I do soil health research. And so I can try to relate to all aspects of this conference, hopefully. And so the way I approached my 10 minutes is s sort of to talk about the caveats of the microbiome a little bit and some of the, the things going on there. And so how do we interpret the soil microbiome and the human microbiome? They're analyzed in very similar strategies. And then how can we relate that to human disease, animal disease, um, whether that's from the soil or not from the soil? And so to start with, obviously we have impressive technology that exists to determine the complete makeup of either the human microbiome or the soil microbiome. And so whether that's next generation sequencing, um, which would be analysis of 16S ribosomal RNA for bacterial species, 18S ribosomal RNA for fungal and other eukaryotic species, um, or shotgun metagenomics where you can get an overview of those communities as well as viral communities and other eukaryotic communities. And so it's very impressive technology. And basically the way it works is you send your sample, whether that's a human sample or a soil sample, you extract the DNA from that sample, you send it off for sequencing, and then through bioinformatics you compare that DNA sequence to annotated reference genome databases, essentially sequence databases, to basically identify what species of organism you're working with. And so as these various calls are made based on your sequence data, um, you get a whole bunch of um, information that is known and a whole bunch of also that is unknown. And so what I did was I took an hour a couple weeks ago and I just looked up a whole bunch of random papers, both human and soil health, and basically looked within those papers and within their data to see how, what percent of the sequences in these studies were unknown, that came back unknown. And it's 10 to 30 plus percent of all DNA sequences that come out of human or soil samples are unknown. And those might be pretty important, at least I think they might be important. And the reason that you know, some of these are unknown is that I will give you one example from an early uh, microbiome paper. And I think this is where some of the data overload comes from. And so in a 2010 paper published in Nature, there was over eight trillion DNA bases sequenced. Okay, so it looks like the national debt. <laughs> it, so now this was eight years ago, okay? And <laughs> so the technology has improved a little bit and the reference databases have, but that represented 81% of those DNA sequences back in 2010 in that particular paper came back as unknown. Okay, so again, what are these unknown bacteria doing? Um, now this paper, since then for the last eight years, has had two citations per day. So it's over 6,000 citations to this paper, okay? And so kind of just gives you an idea of, of maybe how much we don't, we really don't know. And so in my mind, the only real significance in this paper and in many other microbiome papers is there's diversity out there. We may not know as much as we think that we know. So one thing that we do know is that whether it's soil or human health, Diversity is important. The resilience of microorganisms, if one group or species or genus has an adverse effect due to antibiotics, due to climate change, whatever, there's probably another group that can overtake or that can take their place. That's called resiliency. And so if diversity constitutes a healthy microbiome, whether that's soil or human health, what makes up that microbiome? Okay. Um, so, so what has been done to this point? So we have large-scale microbiome sequences, sequencing that has been done on both healthy and unhealthy individuals, comparing those two groups, various diseases, various organ systems, as well as healthy versus unhealthy soils. But what I, the question I would like to pose is, what makes one person healthy and another person unhealthy if you don't have overt disease? I mean, so health is a relative term to me. Um, so I was, a, I'm a cancer survivor, but yet my health may be not as good as some of you that have never had cancer. Um, but yet I'm, you know, 
cured, healthy right now, as, as far as, as I can tell. Um, same thing with the soil. And so, you know, all the variables in a soil, whether it's soil texture, soil pH, um, rainfall, nutrient content, organic matter percentage, all those different variables are going to impact, you know, an overall health score assessment of soil health. And obviously that's going to also have an impact on the soil, soil microbiome. And so there was a question in the first session this morning about the bioavailability of nutrients from food, and there was a reference to, you know, the astronauts that may go to Mars, you know, maybe they can just take a pill to get their nutrients. At least that's the way I kind of taken that, that question and that answer to that question. Well, the way I understand the way that our human gut microbiome work is we have to keep them busy with the foods that we eat. And so, the, so taking a pill with the nutrients may be able to keep us alive, but it, those microorganisms in our gut, they're going to get hangry. <laughs> and we don't want to make them hungry. You know, they're going to get hungry. We want to make them angry. Okay? And so when they get angry, they upregulate virulence factors, okay? and that's when they are more prone to cause disease. And so, you know, for those in NASA, they may want to <laughs> take that into consideration, perhaps. And so the take-home message from that is, and again, health is subjective. It's relative. There's no absolute state of health whether in an individual human or in an individual soil sample. Okay, so next generation sequencing equipment commercially came available on the market starting about 2005. That's where the red arrow is here. And basically what we're looking at is, according to the NCBI, National Library Database, is the number of publications per year regarding that, that dealt with the microbiome. And you can see it's been steadily increasing. This is up to 2016. And so many people are sequencing microbiomes, publishing it. However, if you look at a majority of these papers, their sample collection methods different, they're processing those samples differently, and there is still no optimal protocol for all sample types. Okay. I was speaking with a you know, um, gentleman over lunch saying from, so soils in New Zealand dealing, dealing with heavy volcanic soils. Extracting DNA from those soils is going to be different than a sandy soil versus a clay soil. And so, needless to say, there's some poor methodology, I'm not saying all of them, and, but if there's some poor methodology, it can lead to some inaccurate conclusions in a lot of these papers. And so again, the most predominant functional annotation is unknown. We don't know what the species are, we don't know what they do, and I believe that's problematic. And so what do the scientists do in these studies? They remove the unknown sequences from further analysis, because we don't know what they are. And, and, and it makes sense. I'm guilty of it, too. I'll show you some of my data in a little bit. Um, <laughs> what are you supposed to do? I don't know. I mean, <laughs> we can talk about that over supper. But um, again, because of this, we may fail to capture some of the specialized functions that these unknown microbes are doing. And so this kind of leads us into, you know, which bacteria, which microbes can we culture in a laboratory setting? Which can we unculture? And so a lot of these unknowns are the ones that we can culture. Retro represents 80 to 90% of all bacterial species known. We're not able to grow them in the lab. We're not able to continue to, to uh, study them using um, techniques other than the molecular genetics. And so just, um, I teach undergraduate students. And so this was a project from last year. This is looking at the, the fecal microbiome in four different animal species. Um, and so what I'll just point out to you very quickly is the top orange represents the unknown species from this particular study, okay, going off of the reference database used. And so again, you know, it varies a lot. So in the time that I have, um, you know, so, so how do we begin to identify some of these unknowns? Well, the National Institutes of Health in this country um, almost a decade ago now, uh, started the Human Bi Microbiome Project, where they were attempting to um, categorize and sequence the, the bacteria found in a normal, you know, human homo sapien, so, of uh, American citizens. Um, there's other ones around the, the world. There's the in Integrative Human Microbiome Project. There's one up in Canada. There's one in Australia. Um, but the reference databases that these are contributing to, they're all not integrated. And other studies, they're not necessarily publishing congruent um, sequencing data regarding the sequences that they're finding. 
and they're throwing out the unknown sequences. And so what I'm proposing here today is that there's a need in the research community for both human and soil research for a centralized database and additional reference annotated genomes to help identify some of these unknown bacteria species. Um, so, you know, mo most of the studies out there tend to compare healthy versus diseased humans, healthy versus unhealthy soils, and that goes back to my first point, what constitutes health versus non-health? The other thing we need to focus on, I believe, is the analysis of coexisting and new, relation and new relationships that we find in both the human and the environmental microbiomes, and I think we need to focus on function. And so in my opinion, you know, knowing the bacteria species that are present in these ecosystems is one thing. Knowing what they do is a whole nother game. And so, you know, we know that from, from Gen Bio 1, you know, we get DNA to RNA to protein, right? It's the proteins that do the function. And so if we have five species in an ecosystem that can function the same thing, it may not necessarily matter that we have all five. Maybe we have one or two that can function this and do the same function. And so I will just hypothesize and throw this out there that maybe next-gen sequencing may not be the immediate answer. Maybe we need something where we're looking at messenger RNA in our ecosystems using technology like RNA-seq to determine what proteins that ecosystem is capable of transcribing. So in my last 30 seconds, so what, what, what can we do? So we need new enhanced reference databases, standardized spatial sampling and sequencing protocols across both human and soil ecosystems. Again, further understand function, not the mere presence of these organisms, and then further relate particular species to that function. Um, this is going to take, again, similar to other speakers, microbiologists, geneticists, informaticists, um, computer science, soil science, agronomy, botanists, et cetera, et cetera. And I was always uh, kind of taught to, you know, if you don't ask for it, you'll never get it. So when I came up with some numbers, um, um, I'm asking Santa Claus maybe now after everyone else. But so I said this might take 20 plus years. Let's, let's go up a, another decimal point, so 100 plus million. <laughs> it's only a decimal point, right? <laughs> um, but um, earlier I had mentioned that um, the Human Microbiome Project with the NIH did, and the way that was funded through the NIH was all of the different institutes within the NIH created what was called the NIH Common Fund, and that's what funded that particular study because it didn't fall under the realm of one particular institute. And so I may also suggest the creation of, at least in the United States, a federal intra-agency grant mechanism or pool of money that in which in each institute would, you know, maybe take a tenth of a percent of their total budget and funnel it to these important topics that may be needed for transdisciplinary research. And so, um, but again, this would be across federal agencies similar to that NIH Common Fund. And so this could be, Again, acronyms, U.S. Department of Agriculture, National Science Foundation, National Institute of Health, Food and Drug Administration, Centers for Disease Control, the Veterans Administration, they fund research, Public Health Service, the Department of Defense, they have a huge research budget, Department of Energy, Department of the Interior, NASA, the Environmental Protection Agency, um, the Intelligence Advanced Research Projects Activity is a huge, bio, huge uh, bioinformatics core. Uh, and even the Department of Army and the Department of Navy have huge research components that could possibly be tapped for this, as well as other private and other philopantric, philo, why well, I can't say that word today, <laughs> philanthropic organizations, thank you. <laughs> and with that, we'll take questions.